All right, we have some folks trickling in. If everyone could please uh, find their seats. Welcome to the third uh, session of the Converging Wisdoms uh, question mark uh, conference. Um, I'm Jeremy Brown. I am a professor, assistant professor here in uh, theology. Um, today, um, we have the pleasure of hearing from, uh, from Perry schmidt Leukel, um, uh, who is a professor of religious studies and intercultural theology and one of the principal investigators of, of the cluster of excellence, religion and politics at uh, the University of Münster in Germany. Uh, Perry has published on Buddhism and religious pluralism. His research focuses on religious pluralism, interfaith relations, Buddhist Christian dialogue, and interreligious theology. Uh, he has published more than 30 books, uh, including Understanding Buddhism, Transformation by Integration, How Interfaith Encounter Changes Christianity, Buddhism and Religious Diversity in Four Volumes, Religious Diversity in Chinese Thought, God Beyond Boundaries, A Christian and Pluralistic Theology of Religions. In 2015, Perry presented the renowned Gifford Lectures at the University of Glasgow, uh, published as Religious Pluralism and Interreligious Theology in 2017. Uh, in 2020, uh, he received the Frederick uh, J. Strang Award for Excellence in Buddhist Christian Studies for his voluminous Buddha Mind, Christ Mind, a Christian commentary on the Bodhicaryavatara. You want to help me out, Perry? Bodhicaryavatara. Bodhi, okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Hoffman Academic Award for Intercultural Competence. Um, and uh, Perry's talk, which we'll hear in just a, a moment, will be titled uh, Muslim Buddhist Dialogue and the Contribution of Fritjof Schwann. Um, I also have the, the pleasure of introducing my colleague uh, in theology, Trent uh, Pomplun. Um, Trent uh, uh, is an associate professor uh, and, uh, here uh, in, in theology in Notre Dame. He's the author of A Jesuit on the Roof of the World, which was published in 2010 by Oxford uh, University Press. He's published uh, in uh, many um, uh, 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 prestigious venues, including uh, History of Religions, Journal of uh, Religion, Modern Theology, Buddhist Christian Studies, uh, and other leading journals on Tibetan religion and culture. Uh, the Jesuit, uh, in, uh, on, on these topics, on t Tibetan religion and culture, Jesuit missions in Asia, the study of Asian languages in the early modern church, and various issues in Roman Catholic systematic theology. Uh, Trent's uh, talk today will be called uh, Jesus in Tibet, some notes on a perennialist theme. Uh, so uh, each speaker, since we have uh, two panelists this morning, uh, each uh, speaker will uh, uh, present for 30 minutes, so we have a little bit longer, uh, uh, and, uh, and then we will proceed to uh, a little less than a half an hour of Q&A. Um, I will ask the, uh, 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 those, um, uh, the, the inquisitors, as it were, to uh, keep their questions uh, cons uh, brief and to the point. Um, and we'll also be taking questions from participants via Zoom, uh, who I'll ask to enter uh, their questions into the chat. Uh, so without further ado, uh, uh, Perry schmidt Leukel. Well, th thank you very much for your kind introduction. And... Uh, Again, thanks to Brad for, and, and his team for organizing this conference. I know that was such a long way, and then the pandemic came in between, and uh, finally we are here, and then it will be gone. <laughs> this is how things are. Okay, um, I hope you can understand me. And, uh, I'm getting old. I need my glasses uh, so that I can read my manuscript. Um, So here is Imtios Yusuf, uh, an expert on contemporary Muslim Buddhist encounter. And more than once, uh, Imtios complained about the widespread reciprocal disinterest and deplorable lack of knowledge about each other among the Muslim and Buddhist communities in Asia. 
There have been times when this was markedly different, especially in the early centuries of Islam. Yet even then, Muslim scholars seem to have been significantly more interested in Buddhism than Buddhist scholars in Islam. At least this is the impression we get from the historical evidence. Today, one of the few dialogical initiatives has come from the Buddhist side. That is, the series of international dialogues started by the Taiwanese Dharma master Xin Dao in response to the destruction of the Buddha statues of Bamiyan by the Taliban in 2001. On the other side, the Muslim side, the royal family of Jordan initiated the production of the remarkable document, Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism. This text was published in 2010 and had been drafted by Reza Shah Qasemi, who will speak to us tomorrow. By now, this document is available not only in English and French, but also in Malay, Arabic, Urdu, and Farsi. Yet, as far as I can see, it has not yet caught too much interest on the Muslim side, and even less so among Buddhists, despite the fact that it had been welcomed and supported by the 14th Dalai Lama. One reason may be that the document refers primarily to Mahayana Buddhism and less so to Theravada, while currently the most severe tensions and even violent conflicts exist between Muslims and Theravada Buddhists, such as in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. Of course, there has been the great Zen Buddhist scholar Toshihiko Izutsu who as a Buddhist showed a tremendous interest in Islam, not merely from a position of good scholarly curiosity, but also from a philosophical and even existential interest in the metaphysical insights found in Islam, especially in Sufism. Izutsu's writings on Islam were composed in the second half of the 20th century and display some influence from the traditional school. This influence is even more present in the just mentioned document, Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism. Much of what Shah Qasemi presents in this document is an expanded and refined echo of some key points made by Frithjof Schuon. Hence, it might be worth revisiting Shuan's ideas and inquire about their relevance for any further Muslim-Buddhist dialogue. So I come to my first point, Friedrich Schuan's interreligious hermeneutics. First of all, Shuan does not hold, you know, let me say that again, he does not hold that the core teachings of authentic religions would all be more or less the same. Whoever says that about Shuan simply has not read him. At least these doctrines are not the same according to Shuan in terms of their doctrinal content or in terms of what he calls the exoteric level. Shuan even speaks of Gegensätze in his German publications or antagonisms in English between them. Schuon holds that such stark differences among the religions are incompatible at the exoteric level. However, he also affirms that this does not, quote, affect the one universal truth that they convey. Moreover, religions convey this truth in equally valid ways. Schuon speaks of Gleichwertigkeit or equivalence. According to Schuon, the differences between the religions are rooted in different revelations and are divinely willed. The reason, he says, lies in the differences among the human recipients of revelation, that is, in the diversity of humanity. God wants to reach and save all humanity, and hence 
God relates to humanity in ways that match human diversity. In that respect, revelation does involve a significant measure of human coloring. Or, as Schuon says, the different human beings translate the eternal divine word, the Logos, in their own specific ways. This is possible, according to Schuon, because revelation emerges from the divine presence within each human being. It emerges from what Schuon calls the true self. Look at this quotation from his book, Understanding Islam. In Revelation, it is in the last analysis always the self which speaks. And as its word is eternal, the human receptacles translate it at their root and by their nature, not consciously or deliberately, into the language of particular spatial and temporal conditions. Individualized consciousnesses are so many veils which filter and adapt the blinding light of unconditioned consciousness of the self. If Schuon postulates any such thing as a common core among true religions, this commonality is of a functional nature. It consists in their revelatory and salvific or liberative force. The priority lies on salvation. That is, the revelatory aspect is, according to Schuon, subservient to the soteriological one. Quote, for God, the truth lies in the spiritual or social efficacy. God's first wish is to save rather than instruct. Given the transcendent and simultaneously immanent character of ultimate reality, all finite reality assumes a symbolic nature as soon as it becomes the vehicle of revelation. The esoteric hermeneutics consists in reading the exoteric dimension of religions as symbols, which on the one hand manifest the ultimate, and on the other hand are inclined to point beyond their own limited nature, that is, beyond form, as Schuon calls it, to the transcendent, which is the formless essence of the real. According to Schuon, it is only in this functional or dynamic respect that the doctrinal antagonisms at the esoteric level are overcome. Schuon illustrates the difference between an exoteric perspective and the esoteric symbolism by the analogy of pure light broken by a prism into different colors. The esoteric view as, quote, manifested through a religious symbolism is conscious of the colorless essence of light and of its character of pure luminosity. A given religious belief, on the other hand, will assert that light is red and not green, whereas another belief will assert the opposite. Both will be right in so far as they distinguish light from darkness, but not in so far as they identify it with a particular color. With this kind of hermeneutics, Schuon is much closer to some modern theologians, as he himself was probably aware of. As, for example, to Paul Tillich's interpretation of all religious language as symbolic. Or to Karl Rahner's understanding of religious language as mystagogic. I had I had to choose this photo because it's so gloriously politically incorrect these days. <laughs> or 
to a John Hicks view of all talk about the ultimate real as mythologically true in the sense of bringing persons into the right existential relationship to the real. Yet Schuon was aware of and insisted on the fact that his hermeneutics is in line with traditional interpretations of religious language as we find them in the religious traditions themselves. Uh, I think that the, the accusation that Schuon from some kind of meta perspective or outsider perspective would just uh, 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 force his hermeneutics on the religions is false uh, because it does have a, a, a sub substantial basis in hermeneutical considerations within the religious traditions. And Schuon mentions explicitly um, the hermeneutics, uh, the Muslim hermeneutics of uh, the interplay between similarity and dissimilarity when it comes to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, the divine, the, that is uh, the interplay between uh, uh, Tashbi and Tansi. Or in the case of Mahayana Buddhism, he explicitly uh, refers to the conception of religious language in terms of skillful means, upaya kaushalya. So given, given the discussions that we had yesterday night, I inserted uh, one new slide <laughs> with uh, another quotation from uh, Ashuan, which, which I think captures quite well yeah, what he is going to say. If there are different religions, each of them, by definition, speaking an absolute and hence exclusive language. So he is not denying this kind of exclusivist aspect of religious reality. This is because the difference between the religions corresponds exactly, by analogy, to the differences between human individuals. In other words, if the religions are true, it is because each time it is God who has spoken. And if they are different, it is because has, God has spoken in different languages, in conformity with the diversity of the receptacles. Finally, if they are absolute and exclusive, it is because in each of them, God has said, I. I, I, I find this a very insightful statement. And, uh, it, because it, it, it really says that this kind of absoluteness and exclusivity in the end can only apply to God. Uh, God is the only and therefore exclusively absolute reality. Um, but because of this divine revelation taking place in each religious tradition, this, this kind of, of exclusive absoluteness of God is somehow transferred to the religious traditions and what Chuan is suggesting is not to deny that, but he's inviting the religions to discover that the same kind of process is also happening in the other religious traditions. Okay, there we are. So now we can move on to Schuon's contribution to Buddhist-Muslim dialogue. The hermeneutical approach just sketched allows Schuon to undertake three comparative operations which, according to my view, are of principal and lasting significance for any further Buddhist-Muslim theological dialogue. First, according to Schuon, a religion needs to be understood in its own right. The fundamental question must be whether, and if so, how it conveys truth. Only in a second step, one can enter into a comparative inquiry. And the first step is one to which one will have to revert again and again. Here again, a, a very clear uh, uh, quotation uh, in, in that respect from his book, Treasures of Buddhism. The first question to be asked concerning any doctrine or tradition is that of its intrinsic orthodoxy. That is to say, one must know whether that tradition is consonant, not necessarily with another given traditionally orthodox perspective, yeah, namely my own one, yeah, but simply with truth. As far as Buddhism is concerned, we will not ask, therefore, whether its non-Seism and not atheism is reconcilable in its ex expression 
with Semitic theism or any other, but only whether Buddhism is true in itself, which means if the answer is affirmative, that its non-theism will express the truth or a sufficient and efficacious aspect of the truth, whereof theism provides another possible expression opportune in the world it governs. Second, Schuon's overall symbolic hermeneutics enables him to identify parallels, that is, functional equivalences, where a purely exoteric comparison can only discern deficits. This is particularly evident when one considers the twin major points of the traditional and current Islamic critique of Buddhism, namely the ac accusation that Buddhism is a form of atheism and that Buddhism is a form of idolatry. And of course, I mean, these are the kind of twin cardinal evils uh, from an Islamic perspective. Shuan, and I think rightly so, understands that the Buddhist nirvana is not a denial of ultimate uh, reality. Instead, nirvana refers to the realization of, as Shuan says, a supra-ontological real and being seen inwardly, whereby we are mysteriously attached to the infinite. Let me repeat this. He says, nirvana signifies a supra-ontological real and being seen inwardly, whereby we are mysteriously attached to the infinite. Now, the seen inwardly, of course, refers to the, this dominant kind of contemplative uh, meditative strand in Buddhism. This, this is their kind of, of access uh, to this ultimate reality. In large strands of Buddhism, though clearly not in all of them, the ultimate is not personified and not related to the cosmos as its ontological cause. Instead, Schuon says, its acosmic and anonymous character are emphasized. Hence, Schuon rightly holds that Buddhism is more correctly described as non-theism instead of atheism. The emphasis on the ultimate's acosmic and anonymous nature has its functional parallel, Schuon says, in the conception of the impersonal essence of divinity in the monotheistic esotericisms. Thus, Buddhism is, quote again, centered on the pure absolute and on deliverance. In terms of deliverance, it realizes divine goodness as a kind of, Schuon says, nirvanic grace, which projects itself through a myriad of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas into the round of transmigration. For Schuon, the image of the Buddha is therefore, and he uses that term, a sacramental reality, a union of divine form and human perfection. Its use, the use of, of Buddha images in contemplative and devotional practice is not idolatry. It rather fulfills, says Schuon, a function analogous to the practice of zikr in Islam. For this practice of remembrance brings the practitioner close to their, as Schuon says, normative archetype to the pure Adamic substance made in the image of God, end of quote. In other words, this practice of remembrance, and then by analogy, this is the, the use of Buddha images in, in Buddhism, brings the practitioner to another version of the union between divine form and human perfection. And this process never happens without grace. As Shuan says, well, look, look at this quotation. The acceptance of mercy is like the summit of our liberty. 
Uh, let me read it again. I'm so struck by this. Uh, the acceptance of mercy is like the summit of our liberty. This is certainly a paradox statement, but nevertheless, as I feel a profound insight strongly resonating with St. Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians that all his achievements are not his work, but that of divine grace. Uh, this kind of paradoxical conflation of, of human freedom and divine grace, when it, when, when it went right with human freedom. <laughs> So, third, Schuon's functional or symbolic interpretation of religious forms comes along with his conviction that despite all exoteric differences between the religions, all values and important aspects of truth do in fact emerge within each tradition, but with different emphasis. Each lays stress on one or another aspect of truth. And, quote, the values of one, one religious tradition, are always to be found in the other in some manner. Therefore, one will always find some elements of a specific religious tradition in the other one. However, these elements emerge as a kind of side aspect of the more central features of the respective tradition. Thus, in the overall non-theistic framework of Buddhism, also theistic forms have developed, as for example in Pure Land Buddhism, or with the idea of, the, uh, of an Adi Buddha uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism that is uh, a primordial Buddha in whom all reality is rooted. These are the two uh, uh, kind of semi-theistic uh, forms in Buddhism that Shuan refers to. In that sense, uh, the differences between the religious traditions are an issue of different kinds of emphasis and also of different expertise. Hence, Schuon says, the truth is that every religious form is superior to the others in a particular respect. Now, this idea seems to open up a genuine form of interreligious learning. Each religion receiving inspiration from those aspects in which the other tradition is stronger than one's own. However, in this respect, I find Schuon somewhat ambiguous. On the one hand, he holds that different religious traditions were, at least originally, bound to particular culture spheres, an idea which apparently would not be supportive of the theological goal of interreligious learning. On the other hand, Schuon clearly sees that today interreligious exchange and mutual understanding have become inevitable and mandatory. Yet even in the past, there has been far more intercultural exchange and as a result interreligious transformation and syncretism than Schuon acknowledges. And at least his own personal life seems to testify to the possibility of interreligious learning and the embrace of something like a multi-religious identity. So let me now move on to my concluding remarks. Let me begin with some points of agreement. On my view, the particular strengths of Schuon's contribution to Buddhist-Muslim dialogue and to any theology of religious diversity lies in his hermeneutics. <coughs> he clearly emphasizes that the nature of ultimate reality is beyond all human conceptual understanding and that this is necessarily so because of its radical transcendence. Yeah? If you take, in, within Christianity, if you take this, this famous uh, 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 statement um, by, Anz by Anselm of Canterbury in his Proslogion, uh, Proslogion chapter two, uh, where he says, uh, 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 God, God is that reality uh, 
or greater than which nothing can be conceived. Uh, this is only one, one side of the medal because then he goes on, I think it's in chapter 15, and saying, and, and therefore God is ne necessarily greater than anything that can be conceived. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I think this is, this is really clear logic uh, because if, if, if God would be the, the ma maximum conceivable reality, then someone could say, but there's a reality even greater because it's so great that it can't be conceived. And, and God instantiates uh, uh, ma maximal greatness, then God has to be, by simple logic, greater than anything that can be conceived. And we find very, very similar arguments in each of the major religious traditions. Uh, so I think Sh Shuan is, is, is clearly right uh, in, in this respect. Uh, uh, and, and this is a fact that is so often ignored or even denied today by some self-declared orthodox authors in the theology of religion, which seem to be completely forgetful of the apophatic uh, uh, strands in the major religious traditions. Or if you if you want another Catholic uh, uh, authority, Tom, Thomas Aquinas, uh, the, the ultimate that we can know of the ultimate is that we cannot know it, uh, and this is not meant in the Socratic skeptical sense. It is it's it's a full acknowledgement. This is real knowledge of God if we understand that this reality necessarily exceeds all human understanding. Okay. Schuon is clearly right also in his affirmation that divine ineffability requires a hermeneutics of religious language that gives full weight to this apophatic insight. Yeah? We, we, cannot, we cannot say on the one hand, uh, well, yeah, God is ineffable, and then we go on writing 10 volumes of systematic uh, uh, theology on the nature of God. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this does not fit together. Huh? If we are serious about divine ineffability, then we need to explain huh, what we mean with the cataphatic expressions that uh, all religions also use when they talk about the ultimate. So I agree with Schuon that the best approach to such adequate hermeneutics of positive language needs to start with the soteriological function of religions and should not mistake religious teachings as supernatural or divine instruction. Finally, Schuon's intuition that each religious tradition contains some features of the others is very close to my own theory that religious diversity displays fractal patterns. This theory claims that major typological differences between the religious traditions reappear at the level of inner religious diversity that is within each religious tradition and also at the even smaller level of individual people who may combine different forms of religion either simultaneously or successively in the course of their lives. Hence, there is a structural correspondence between patterns of religious diversity at the global macro level of interreligious diversity, the meso level of inner religious diversity, and the micro level of intrasubjective religious diversity. And this is what one calls a fractal structure. On the other hand, I don't want to conceal, after all that praise, <laughs> that I have significant concerns about some aspects of Schuon's work, such as his excessive and more or less undifferentiated rejection of modernity, his inappropriate epistemic self-certainty, that is, his lack of sensitivity to the possibility that he might err, his all too easy readiness of condemning those who hold different opinions or follow different methods, such as in historical and historical critical studies of religious texts. At one place, he says that modern historical, uh, 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 his historical exegesis of, of uh, uh, religious texts uh, looks as if it is written by the devil. I mean, this, this just displays a complete misunderstanding, I would say, of what is going on. Um, his overall elitist demeanor and his insufficient and highly problematic discussion of religiously motivated violence. There are passages in his work where, where he seems to say this is all fine. 
to mention just some of my major concerns. Yet despite such grave worries and serious criticisms, I cannot help but express my deep appreciation of the important insights that are also found in his work. Although Schuon, to the best of my knowledge, had been more or less self-educated when it comes to the study of the history of religions and was not a properly trained scholar, at times he nevertheless expresses in wonderful words and dense clarity a level of understanding that one sometimes seeks in vain in the writings of learned experts. Let me conclude with one such passage found right at the beginning of his tre uh, Treasures of Buddhism. Here he says, when we come to contemplate Buddhism, we may discern at its base a message of renunciation and at its summit a message of mystery. In another, so to speak, horizontal dimension, we see a message of peace and one of mercy. Let me emphasize that this is, as Shuan says, what we may discern in Buddhism. We all know that in Buddhism, as in any other religious tradition, there is also much to be discerned that testifies to the opposite of such values. A violently displaced Rohingya Muslim from Myanmar will surely not see peace and mercy in Buddhism. And a Yazidi woman enslaved by ISIL or Daesh will not see any such values in Islam. But this is just one side of the medal. If Muslims and Buddhists, through reciprocal efforts, would recognize in both traditions the spirit of renunciation, mystery, peace, and mercy, as it is highlighted by Fritjof Schuhn, the dialogue among them would make a big step forward. Thank you for listening. Um, I should uh, begin by saying that um, I don't know a lot about perennialism. Uh, so please, please don't hold uh, anything I say against uh, Brad here. Um, listening to all the, the great papers that we've had, I, I wish I'd written a different paper. I, I kind of now have a, kind of a lot of thoughts about the role of ineffability in Buddhist philosophy. Um, but I didn't write a paper on that. I wrote a paper on a perennialist theme that uh, occasionally enters um, the discussion through the Vedanta Mat, uh, namely the presence of Jesus in India or Tibet. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is kind of uh, offer a, a little history of, of this debate uh, with an eye to what it can maybe teach us a little bit about the, the history um, and origins of perennialism. So in 1890, uh, Nicholas Natovich published The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ, uh, an account of his travels in the Himalayas and his discovery of a hitherto unknown gospel. Um, it's, it's a great story. When hiking through Ladakh, Natovich broke his leg being forced to convalesce at Hemis, a Drupakaju monastery south of Leh, the capital of Ladakh. There, as fortune would have it, uh, he discovered that Buddhists possessed a life of Christ based on ancient manuscripts, the originals of which were kept in Lhasa, but a digest of which was there at Hemis, along with an interpreter who translated passages from this hidden gospel as Natovich eagerly transcribed them. The figure we meet in Natovich's gospel isn't unfamiliar. Um, he's a teacher of primitive monotheism and a surprisingly modern ethical system. Natovich's Jesus, however, stole away at 14 to India 
to study the Vedas and to learn to heal and to cast out spirits by prayer. He's proto-feminist, strongly egalitarian, pro-family, and appears at least on my reading to support a single world government. Um, Natovich is pretty vague on the textual details. He remarks at one point that the original manuscripts in Lhasa were written with utmost precision by Buddhist and Brahmin historians. He remarks at another, though, that they're written in Pali. At yet another point, he mentions that his own recension, or maybe the copy at uh, Hemis, it, it's not quite sure, or it's not quite certain. Um, he suggests that this is a composite of several different manuscripts brought from India, Nepal, and Magadha. He notes the diffuse nature of the Tibetan materials, acknowledging that he found the information on Jesus only in the second volume, which he then had to edit for clarity and chronology. Natovich assures us that he uh, took photographs of all the manuscripts, but he just happens to have lost them. Okay. Now, as you might expect, the pushback against Natovich has been significant. Uh, scholars of the New Testament especially, not least among them Bart Ehrman, uh, have been really exercised uh, by Natovich. Um, arguably, the most biting criticism came from the Orientalist Max Mueller. Uh, Mueller's review is a, a real masterpiece of wit and satire. Um, you, should, you should read it. Um, here are the, the facts as uh, Mueller presented them. No British official or Moravian missionary, of which there were several, seems to have seen Natovich in Ladakh. None of them seem to have heard of him. Nor would Natovich have been, should he have traveled in disguise or otherwise escaped notice, been the first traveler to have been sped spurious manuscripts by Brahmins or Buddhists. Um, Francis Wilford, Mueller reminds us, had already placed the story of Noah and his three sons, even much of Genesis in the Himalayas. Louis Jacolio had similarly demonstrated, again, based on fraudulent manuscripts, that Jesus had learned Freemasonry from the Brahmins. Right? Such attempts to discover the Indian origins of the Gospels or to place Jesus in the Himalayas, Muller remarks, are common in popular literature. But they have no place in genuine scholarship. Natovich's Gospel can't be found in the Tibetan canon and it would be far easier to account for these legends from Islamic sources. In this spirit, one could also point out that there's little reasons, reason that Tibetans would have polytexts, um, th they wouldn't have been written on scrolls, and, and so on. Right? You can multiply these objections kind of indefinitely. At the end of the day, Mueller says sarcastically, it is pleasanter to believe that Buddhist monks can sometimes be wags than that Natovich himself is a rogue. Still, more than a few people accepted Natovich's gospel. Swami Abednanda, for example, claimed to have seen the Tibetan manuscript uh, at Hemis in 1922. Nicholas Rorick, who followed much the same route through Ladakh in 1925, quotes it extensively. Uh, oddly, Rorick hedges his bets. The local people, he says, know nothing of the published work, but they do know the same legend in several variants, probably, he says, borrowed from Syriac Christian sources. Now, strangely, Rorick had nothing good to say about Hemis. He characterizes the people as half literate and the lamas as prejudiced, greedy, and fanatical. He's quick to cite a sensitive but unnamed Hindu guide in support of Christ's travel to India and Tibet, but he also makes sure to communicate his amazement 
that the local Moravian missionaries denied these legends. Now, here's the interesting thing to me, though. Rarick traveled with his son, George, a renowned Tibetanist who collaborated with the Tibetan scholar, Gedan Chumpe. I find it hard to imagine that the junior Rarick would have countenanced Natovich's claims about the Tibetan language, uh, that its most pure form was spoken in Ladakh, that there was a separate dialect spoken by men and women, and so forth. But his implicit corroboration does make me wonder whether there might be some kernel of truth to Natovich's story. Frauds weren't unknown, of course. Accounts of travels in the Himalayas sold briskly enough to tempt many people to try their hands at the genre, many people that had never been to Asia. Um, seems to have been a fad in Philadelphia for some reason. I don't know why that was. Uh, it's not beyond um, the realm of possibility, of course, that uh, the Tibetans themselves were wags as uh, you know, as um, Mueller claims. Um, it's not unknown for Tibetans to have some fun at the expense of gullible spiritual seekers. Okay. I've seen it a few times myself. Okay. Um, but one would also never directly refuse someone in Tibetan culture. You know, um, as, as the common Tibetan saying goes, there are 100 ways to say no in Tibetan, and 99 of them begin with the word yes. Okay. Um, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that what we have here is neither a fraud nor a joke, but some very real combination of wishful thinking on the part of Natovich and inept translation on the part of his interpreter. If you think the latter impossible, take a look at the Dalai Lama's official speeches as translated by the Tibetan government in exile from the 60s, which regularly speak of God and his providence. Right. Now, I, I think Notovich is a complete mess. Let me be very clear about this. Um, play along with me for a second. Uh, when Levi Dowling tried his hand at writing a new gospel, the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, right, uh, he tried to make it look like a canonical gospel, right? Um, Rurik also quotes extensively from Dowling, but he doesn't cite him by name. So he, he also advances the idea found there that Jesus was in Lhasa, which didn't exist as a city at the time, learning Sanskrit from, I think, Mencius. Okay, so um, it, he says Mungso, which I, I think, I'm not sure if he realizes that's Mitchus or not, but in any case, when, when Dowling tried this, you know, at, at least in terms of tone and style, right, it's a crushing failure. Um, well, Natovich's gospel, content aside, actually looks kind of Tibetan. Okay, that doesn't look that much unlike the kind of stanzas you'd see in the Pema Tongyi or a standard Tibetan hagiography, right? I mean, just a little. Now, it's not as if Tibetans were unaware of Christianity. There are all sorts of sources that an inept translator and an overly creative editor could have turned into a new gospel. Moravians had been in the area since 1855. Right? That year, August Wilhelm Hede and Edward Pagel made a reconnaissance mission of Zangskar and Ladakh, and when they were turned away at the Tibetan border, they uh, settled in uh, Kielang, in British Lahul. Right? Um, Heinrich August Jeske, the first of several great Moravian Tibetanists, uh, arrived the following year. Right? One of Jeske's collaborators was Sonam Stopkis, a Ladakhi scholar who had lived at Hemis. Right? Um, nor was Jeske himself unknown at Hemis. He visited often to, to watch the ritual dances. Um, 
Biesche, of course, translated the Bible and several liturgical texts and formula into central Tibetan and Ladakhi. Scattered references to Jesus also appear in Tibetan literature from its beginnings, being taken from Manichaean, Muslim, and Syriac uh, Christian sources. Fuller descriptions of Christianity and its teachings begin to appear in Tibetan literature from the mid-18th century onwards, often uh, in Sadanto or, or Drunta literature. Any, even many of these sources could have found their way to Hemis. And to be completely fair, some of Mueller's arguments are wrong. There is little reason to think that a life of Christ would have to appear in the Tibetan canon. Should it have existed, it would have been classified as a namtar, or tale of liberation, uh, which don't normally appear in the, in the canon, right? Um, Mueller also included a letter from an unnamed correspondent who argued that Natovich uh, couldn't have, have been at Hemis because no European could possibly tolerate how filthy it was. All right. Uh, that, that hasn't aged that well. Right. Um, now, the one point, though, on which Mueller is truly wrong, and the point missed in much of the academic literature, is, the is that claims like Natovich's were merely popular and not genuinely academic. And that's what I'd really like to highlight. Today, we tend to associate claims of Jesus visiting Tibet with theosophists like M Madame Blavatsky and Levi Dowling, or perhaps New Age seers like Edgar Cayce and Elizabeth Clare Prophet. We do so, I think, precisely because Max Mueller tarred Natovich with this association. This, though, however right it might be, obscures the historical context that made Natovich so fascinating to his contemporaries. In fact, I think a case can be made that Natovich's gospel, however fraudulent, was not aimed at theosophists at all, but precisely at respectable scholars like Max Mueller. We see something of this when we look at the conclusion of Mueller's review. How long, he asks, have we wished for a real historical life of Christ without the legendary halo? written not by one of his disciples, but by an independent eyewitness, free of miraculous accretions, so that the historical Christ, though different from the Christ of the Gospels, would be welcomed by all who can believe in his teaching, even without the help of miracles. Not to put too fine a point on it, Natovich and Mueller were Not to put too fine a point on it, uh, Natovich and Mueller were both modernists of a sort, eager to exclude traditional religious claims to self-understanding and any methods of exegesis they thought unscientific. And in point of fact, the 1880s had seen an explosion of writings, both popular and academic, that sought to demonstrate Buddhist influence on Christianity. Works like Ernest de Bunsen's The Angel Messiah of Buddhists, Essenes, and Christians. Or Arthur, Arth, excuse me, or Arthur Lilly's uh, Buddhism in Christendom, or Jesus the Essene. Right? Um, these works differ on their details, but the basic idea is that Buddhist missionaries sent to the ends of the earth by the Emperor Ashok had eventually arrived in Palestine, where they taught you know, various Buddhist ideas to the Essenes or um, John the Baptist, or Paul, or uh, maybe even Christ himself. Now here Jesus and the Buddha come together as being teachers of a reasonable, if not rational, faith, uh, and of course, fierce critics of ritual and priestcraft. I think you probably see where I'm going with this. Um, there are more than a few historical ironies here. 
Uh, Bunsen, for example, was a creator of a virulently anti-Semitic form of Aryan sun worship. And it's every bit as bad as it sounds. Uh, Lilly was better known for his works on um, croquet. Um, I don't have the scholarly expertise to evaluate those works. Um, I'm sure they're masterpieces of their genre. Uh, to me, the thing that's always funny about them is they, they actually sound like occultic works. Like his famous work was uh, entitled uh, The History, Rules, and Secrets of Croquet. Now, that said, um, Bryce Davids was a fan of Bunsen. And Bunsen's father, a Prussian diplomat to the Vatican, was one of Max Mueller's patrons. And all of this was very mainstream and respectable. Among the most famous defenders of Buddhist influence on the New Testament, we find Rudolf Seidel, Otto uh, Fleiderer, Ernst Kuhn, Ricard Pichel, Karl Neumann, Hendrik Kern, maybe Hermann Oldenburg. You know, Oldenburg kind of, he kind of sat on the fence on the issue. Now, these, these names might seem obscure. Um, they'd be, they're fairly well known in the history of Orientalism and Indology, of course. Um, Seidel was a student of Christian Hermann Weisse. Okay. Uh, Weisse uh, was the originator of the, the two-source hypothesis of New Testament authorship. Okay. So um, on this model, um, the Gospel of Mark was the first gospel written and one of two sources, right? The other being Q, um, that influenced the writing of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, right? So this is still broadly scholarly orthodoxy. Now, Sadel argued that the gospel writers depended not merely on a primitive version of Mark and Matthew, but also on a third Buddhist source, a, kind of, a Buddhist cue, as it were. Uh, Flatterer was a student of Ferdinand Christian Bauer and a scholar of Jakob Berma and Meister Eckhart. Um, Kuhn, Pischel, Neumann, and Kern all made important contributions to our understanding of Hinduism and Buddhism. These men were not popular writers. They were professors at some of the most prestigious universities in Europe. They were the most important scholars of their day. Okay. Now, the historical critical methods pioneered by these men, methods that they turned against traditional religious claims to self-understanding and supposedly unscientific methods of exegesis, have largely caused their project of demonstrating Buddhist influences on Christianity to unravel. Arguably, no religious tradition's claims to antiquity have suffered so much from modern historical criticism as those of Buddhism. Most of the texts used to demonstrate the priority of Buddhism to Christianity and so to explain Buddhist influences on the gospel or even Jesus' own travels in India and Tibet have been shown to be much younger than we once thought. Mm -hmm. um, Ashva Gosha's Buddha Charita is contemporaneous with the Gospel of John. Uh, the Abhinish Kramana Sutra is from the late second or early third century. The Lalita Vistara Sutra is from the third. The Mahavastu is from the fourth. Buddha Gosha's uh, Nidana Kataz is uh, from the fifth, and so on. Right. Um, you can push the early strands of certain Mahayana texts back into the first century, maybe even the first century BC. But in the cases relevant to this issue, we find ourselves in Gandhara or some other place along the Silk Road uh, where there are already extensive east-west contracts. More recent attempts to show Indian influence on the Gospels based on the Yoga Sutras, of course, crash on the same shores. The Yoga Sutras cite Vasubandhu. Right? They're, they're fourth, maybe fifth century works. Now, these are, are minor historical quibbles. Uh, I'm a historian, so these things, these are kind of the things that interest me. Uh, Buddhist studies, authors writing on croquet. 
What might we learn from the squabble between Max Mueller and Natovich? Um, first, I think we need to note that these debates took place in the ambit of late 19th and early 20th century cultural Protestantism. It is in this context that the canon and the vocabulary of perennialism takes place. Not that there's anything wrong with that, it just should be noted. It's a world largely determined by the tastes and prejudices of Kant, Hegel, Schelling, Fichte, Schleiermacher, and Schopenhauer, however great they might be. This is important to understand for the history of Buddhist studies in the West, where the alleged scholasticism of scholastic authors like uh, Le Valle Poussin was called into question even as Kantian and quasi-Hegelian interpretations of Buddhism were advanced, right? By Trubatsky, most famously, but also by people like Murti, for whom the rather stark differences in self-understanding of the individual Buddhist philosophical schools dissolved into an ineffable absolute. An absolute, maybe to use the terms of, of Hegel himself, uh, that is no more than a night in which all cows are black. Now second, and this, this doesn't need to be belabored, but I, I think it does have to be said. As often as not, these works of Indology and Buddhist studies were marked by strongly nationalist, if not colonialist, tendencies. Why, after all, should anyone desire so ardently to remove Jesus from Palestine and place him in India or Tibet? Why would his purported authority depend, at least in part, on being relocated to Asia? Now, scholars have spent a lot of time uh, unpacking the political dimensions of Indomania in France, Germany, and England. You know, I, I don't have to rehearse all of that here. Still, it's hard for me not to see the squabble between Mueller, the Brit, and Natovich, the Russian, as a tiny skirmish in the great game being played between Great Britain and Russia over Central Asia in the late 19th century. Perhaps it's a small thing to stake one's claims in ancient myths and manuscripts, but that's exactly what I think um, has been done here. And these claims were political. And even the most respectable scholars get caught up in these larger battles. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Perry and Trent. Uh, it's now 10.06, and we have uh, 24 minutes for Q&A. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, anyone with questions to please approach the, the mic that's uh, in the center of the room, and please keep your questions concise and to the point. Uh, oh, pardon me. There's a mic over here on this side of the room and a mic over here on the, uh, this side. Uh, and we'll also, I also want to encourage um, Zoom participants to submit their questions uh, into the chat, and I will um, put your questions to uh, the speakers. Thank you. Okay, shall I go ahead? Please. Okay, thank you. So, my my, I thoroughly enjoyed both presentations. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, it's really more of a comment than a question, but for Trent, and uh, you might find it to be of interest. There's actually a Jane connection with the story of Jesus in India. You might already be aware of this. Uh, Virchan Gandhi, who was the Jain representative to the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893, a few years after that wrote an extensive introduction to one of the editions of uh, Natovich's book. And he was very much in favor of the, of the thesis. And in, in his introduction, he bases his argument mainly on uh, Roman and Greek trade routes, and basically arguing for the plausibility of, of the idea. But uh, he was quite taken with it, which, which is interesting given the position of the Jains also in, uh, in this period. So. 
Uh, yeah, well, one thing uh, just to, to add on that, thank you very much for the comment. Um, um, that, yeah, I, I don't think anyone would doubt the plausibility. I mean, the trade routes are open, there's plenty of, of exchange. Um, that's with, without a doubt. And, and one thing, just to, to explain this context too, is, is of course there, um, there are different ways in which one might argue for Jesus' presence in Asia. Um, there's a long tradition of Muslim sources um, uh, that are rooted, um, of course, in the traditional notions of Christ not actually being crucified, but then settling in Kashmir. So even Apollo Desideri uh, mentions that the Kashmiris have the tomb of Christ there, right? This is a, this gets picked up uh, uh, in the Ahmadiyya sect and it's very important uh, also as a way to kind of mention uh, or as a way of, of making these arguments in modern sources. Um, and of course, the, the one thing that no one doubts, and you know, one thing here I should maybe give uh, both Mueller and, uh, or Mueller and Rurik uh, their credit here, is that their explanations are correct. There are plenty of Islamic uh, and Syriac Christian sources. Of course, now we tend to see most of these sources entering through, into Tibet through monarchism. Or I shouldn't say now, I mean, this is also the last 150 years. Uh, those aren't the traditional claims, but they're the modern academic claims. Uh, so yeah, the, the, no one doubts that there are many legends there. Uh, they're actually far more than I think most people realize, but that's, precisely why many of these scholars in the 19th century uh, could be taken in so quickly and why they were so excited. Uh, they were discovering a lot of these for the first time. But that's a, a great point. There, there's, even, there's much more to this story than, than, than just what I, I mentioned here. And there's a lot more historical evidence, which again, it comes through all of this, this long history Could you pass me the, the other mic, please? Hello? Hello? There we go. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to take uh, take the opportunity to ask Trent a question myself, if I, if I may. Um, I want to uh, invite you, Trent, to elaborate on your comment uh, about what was at stake in pinning Jesus' authority on a uh, terrain outside of Palestine. Um, obviously, what comes to mind for me is this, the um, the interest, uh, the great interest in. Um, the area in Jesus, especially among Protestant theologians. Uh, uh, would you uh, be able to sort of elaborate on this? Um, yeah, perhaps a bit more broadly. Yeah, um, yeah um, I, I think the general tendency um, begins, um, you know, with the Indomania uh, of the early 19th century in which there is a desire um, to tie one's own culture back to the earliest uh, forms of history, um, which were then identified uh, with India. Uh, and in a lot of ways, these, um, these trends just continued from there. So as, as people learned a little bit more about Tibet, and it seemed more remote and more exotic uh, than India, uh, that had become more familiar through colonialism, uh, you know, people staked increasingly stake their claims on Tibet rather than India as a, a, a very ancient civilization. You know, this is why Dowling can talk about Lhasa in the first century, um, you know, presuming that it's just a, simply a timeless city, I suppose, you know. Um, but, um, you know, Bunsen's a great example of that, um, a late example. But it's, um, it's part of a, a, a broad trend, I think, 
in trying to locate one's present culture and form a connection to um, the human civilization before the classical age, uh, before its European origins, you know, in Greece uh, and Rome. I think that's the larger, um, the larger impetus. Uh, and it, you know, it it's, was partly because, um, you know, sometimes it's said, uh, and this is to take nothing, uh, uh, of course, away from the, the Germans who really dominated learning and culture in the, you know, in the 19th century. Um, but uh, it's often said that the, you know, that Germans not being able to find themselves in the, uh, you know, in the classical sources needed to kind of find uh, an earlier source to locate their culture. You know, so sometimes this is an, an argument made. Uh, maybe it's a little polemical, but uh, I think um, polemics aside, uh, there is some truth in that. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, we have a few questions from the chat. Um, we'll, this question uh, comes from Albert uh, Frollo. Uh, I would like actually to ask, uh, before reading uh, Albert's question, to, to uh, encourage the um, participants via Let's try this again. Uh, I want to encourage the participants um, who are entering questions into the Zoom chat to please specify um, uh, to whom your, your question is addressed. Uh, here's a question from Albert Frollo. Um, Perennial philosophy sees itself as a transcendent doctrine grounding religions. But what grounds this doctrine itself? In other words, how can one be methodically certain that this doctrine itself is true simply by observing similarities, but observation itself must be grounded in some theory? So, uh, yeah, how do we know? I, I assume that question is addressed to Perry. Well, um, I um, personally, I would say we, we do not know and we cannot know uh, because uh, 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 we are, we are not omniscient, we are fallible human beings, so we might be wrong. There, there is not a, there's not a thing, among all these arguments for the existence of God or the existence of an ultimate reality, uh, none of these arguments uh, has been proven to be coercive. Uh, um, so when, when we are subjectively certain and convinced of the reality of, uh, of, of, of the existence of transcendent reality, we still may be wrong. Uh, sub subjective certainty uh, is not a guarantee uh, for truth. Uh, <laughs> when, 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 when I was teaching uh, decades ago at uh, uh, the University of Munich, uh, I, I used to have a course this, which went late until half past nine at night. And, and then after a long day of teaching, I, I entered the subway and was always subjectively certain that uh, I'm on my way home. But uh, very often I found out that I had entered the wrong direction. Uh, and my subjective certainty had absolutely no impact uh, on the objective direction of, of the tube. <laughs> um, <laughs> And as long as we do not have any decisive argument, uh, uh, irrefutable argument for the existence of an ultimate reality, we may be wrong. But this does not imply that there is no ultimate reality. Uh, this, this is also logically false. I mean, Friedrich Nietzsche in the 19th century he said, well, uh, God's existence cannot be proven, therefore God does not exist. This is false. <laughs> um, and. Uh, when, when it comes to perennialists, uh, um, well, I wouldn't say, uh, per perennialism maybe is a kind of too ambiguous term because uh, there's a big difference between perennialists like Aldous Huxley and the traditional school. And even among people in the traditional school, there are some significant differences. Uh, if, if I am right, 
uh, in, in this respect than, than Schuon in his earlier uh, works, as for example, in the early versions of the transcendent unity uh, of religions, uh, he is admitting that we do not actually infallibly know uh, that uh, all, all the authentic religions uh, are rooted in this ultimate divine reality, but that this is a hypothesis that we can that we can draw from the observation of the religious traditions themselves. He uses the image of a circle which we do not see, of which we have only certain fragments, but by the kind of bendedness of, of, of these fragments, yeah, uh, uh, we can conclude that these might be indicative of the existence of this uh, circle. Huh? And um, it's a kind of probabilistic uh, 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 argument. And, and I would say that this is the maximum that we can achieve of. But, uh, uh, Schuon in, in increasingly, I felt, uh, um, and this was, was one of the points of my own personal criticism of him, um, be, became too much certain about uh, his, his own ideas. Uh, uh, I mean, to, towards the end of his writings, I mean, uh, he writes as, as if he would be omniscient. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> Some, some theologians had the same problem. Yeah? I mean, uh, um, I need to tell you this nice uh, little anecdote that uh, um, Karl Barth uh, is said uh, that once when he attended the funeral of uh, one of his colleagues, uh, the local bishop gave the sermon for the funeral of the colleague, and after the sermon, Barth went to him and said, oh, oh bishop, this, this was a wonderful funeral service, and if I were God, I would wish that you could also give the, the funeral service for my own funeral. And then the bishop is said to have responded to Barth, Oh, Professor Bart, this is the first time that I hear from you that you are not God. <laughs> <laughs> and this fits very well with the way how he writes. So it's not only a problem of Schuon, but I think it's a, sometimes we, we should, I think if we are intellectually honest, we, 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 we have to admit that this is, it is a logical and a metaphysical and ontological possibility, but we cannot claim that we know for sure. Very just a short question for you. Do we know who Schwann was reading? Who um, have any sense of what were the f significant influences on his theology of religions? Well, certainly we know some. I mean, René Guénon, of course, uh, uh, exerted a great influence uh, on Schwann for quite some while. Um, to, I, I'm sure there are experts here, uh, uh, such as Fitzgerald, or so who, who might be more competent to answer that question. But when it comes to the, the question of uh, how Schuon knew about Buddhism, um, uh, there's at least one figure that was important, Marco Pallis, uh, who also belongs uh, to the traditional school. and. Uh, he himself, uh, he was a kind of, of, of Greek, uh, 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 a Buddhist of Greek origin, and uh, he himself had, had written very interesting uh, 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 stuff um, on, on Buddhism, and that exerted uh, a strong influence on Schuon's own views uh, of Buddhism. Yeah. But when it comes to his larger theology of religions, um, the, 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 the most important influence is certainly René Guénon. Uh, Well, this is a question for Professor uh, schmidt Leukel. Uh, uh, let me say I greatly enjoyed your presentation. Uh, very many profound insights. Uh, my question is a follow-up to the previous question that was asked of you, and that has to do with certainty, uh, the certitude that you presented a concern with. My question is, without loss of consistency, can we be certain that there is no such a thing as absolute intellectual infallibility?
Okay. Well, there's a long discussion, as you will know, uh, in in the Euro European history of of mind about uh, uh, skepticism. Uh, I, I mean, coming coming from. Um, ancient uh, Greece and uh, Pyrrhonian skepsis. Uh, and I think if, if you are a consistent, uh, well, if you are a persistent <laughs> skeptic, uh, uh, this is difficult to refute. Uh, I, 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 I mean, there have been a number of attempts, uh, Descartes is, is one of the most prominent uh, uh, ones to refute this kind of skepticism, but uh, in the end, uh, who, who, do, who does guarantee us uh, that logical um, logical consistency and, and combined with whatever sort of certainty uh, does really reveal the truth? Uh, I, I would say, I mean, I'm not a skeptic. Uh, I think it, it, it is reasonable and <laughs> rational to rely that this is revealing of truth. Uh, so I'm a realist. Uh, uh, I'm not a skeptic, but I have to admit to skepticism uh, that we cannot, uh, from there, um, uh, build, build a bridge to somewhat like absolute, in, in, infallible certainty. Yeah? Um, and, and, well, religions and religious thinkers are somewhat ambiguous about this. You know, when, when you think of Christianity, for example, or uh, St. Paul, uh, he says, uh, we, we do not know for certain. Yeah? We, live in, we live in the mode of, of uh, believing, of trusting. Uh, if you think of 1 Corinthians 13, yeah? we, we, are not, we are not yet uh, seeing clearly. We, we are seeing as in or through a dark mirror, as you said. Very, very, very interesting, because in the mirror, what you see in the mirror is primarily yourself. <laughs> and um, so, and, and while, while other, other religious thinkers also were, were more confident uh, about some kind of in, infallible certainty, but uh, I mean, personally, I want to be intellectually honest, and I, I think, uh, it belongs to the, the human nature and human existence um, <laughs> that, that our feeling of certainty and, and also logical certainty is not certain <laughs> when it comes to the question of, of inf infallible certainty. Yeah. So a long talk, uh, short answer, I'm a fallibilist also in religious matters. Yeah. Thank you for your response. Uh, a logician will object to that and will say, without consistency, there is no persuasive power. So we should all remain silent. So if we want to talk and say anything, a logician would say, we have to adhere to consistency. Otherwise, anything could be said with the same validity. So we have to assume consistency, and this is one of the eternal truths, which is built in. And that is why I uh, resorted to consistency. Can we deny certitude, absolute certitude, with absolute certitude deny that without loss of consistency? Thank you. This will be the last response, and it'll come from Professor Perry. Briefly, uh, may, maybe you misheard me. I'm, I'm absolutely in favor of logical consistency because this, this, it has been proven quite helpful. Um, nevertheless, there are a number of issues where logical consistency leads us into paradoxical situations. And we cannot deny that either. And the big question is what, what that tells us about logic. 
And this is a question with a, with a religious dimension. Uh, I'm, I, I've, I've studied for decades intensively uh, Nagarjuna's uh, logical dialectics. Uh, and and he, is, he is so much on logical consistency. And with logical consistency, he shows the limits of logic. Uh, and I think this is a, a very important achievement. For Mr. Barry Smith, I appreciate very much your speech. And I would like to know just um, if human beings are gifted with the power of knowing and discernment, and they are able to reason, to reason and the power of logic. And how is it that they cannot be sure of that we know what knows in them, the power of knowing. Not the personal knowing, but that power of knowing, that gift of knowing. For what purpose is that power, if not to be certain of knowing that which knows in us? OK, thank you. Uh, this will be the last uh, response this time, and yeah, again from Perry. Well, I mean, it's a matter of experience that we sometimes are very certain about things that turn out to be wrong, right? Have you never had that experience? I have it all the time. And, uh, and the, the other thing, I mean, what do we, what do we mean by knowing? There's a, there's a long and, and really, really good philosophical debate about what that means. And, and one, one, one of the most influential, I think, one, and also one of the most thought-provoking philosophical essays in the 20th century is this famous essay, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? Uh, and this is a really, really good question. Because if we, under, if we understand truth, and the first question is, how do we define truth? Yeah? But if we understand truth, in the very traditional way, and I'm in favor of this, as the correspondence between a proposition and the matter of facts. You know? A correspondence between reality and our beliefs, our propositions, our statements. If they correspond, then the proposition is true. Huh? Um, but uh, So there can be true propositions, but that does not mean, and I hope there are many true propositions, I hope what I'm saying now is true in that sense. You know? Uh, but how can I know for sure? This, this, is a, this is another difficult question. And I think most that we can achieve, actually, is something like justified beliefs which also happen to be true. This is wonderful. But we cannot know that for sure. It might turn out, in the end, that we are wrong. And what about realized, realized knowledge, self-knowledge, awakening, what about it? Well, see, for example, to give you only one skeptical example, uh, uh, you could come up with a theory that God has created the world just right now with all of us and all the memories that we believe to have about the past. Huh? How can you refute that? There's no way. You cannot prove that this theory is false. It could be true, but we cannot prove it. So this is one example of plenty of skeptical arguments. So. Which, which clearly show us that we should moderate our claims to certainty and, and, and our absolute Okay, well, it seems we have come up against the limits of our knowledge and certainty as well as time. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, uh, close the session. I want to thank again uh, uh, Perry schmidt Loikel and uh, Trent Pomplin for uh, presenting two very stimulating papers. And uh, please join us now uh, in the foyer for coffee. Thanks. Thank you.